Derek, put your headphones on or you can't hear me. There you are. Thank God for that. Okay. Welcome to episode number 65 of The Carmudgeon Show. Part of the Haggerty Podcast Network. My name is Jason Camisa. I am Derek Tam hyphen Scott. And you're going to clap. You're... <laughs> You know what? Never mind. <laughs> uh, this episode is sponsored by Reliable Carriers. Who will reliably carry? Your car. Your car. <laughs> and closed. <laughs> uh, the most important thing for you to know is that uh, orange is the official color of the uh, Reliable Carrier carrier thing that's a truck that goes out. Look at you with the orange thing. Is this uh, on purpose? Uh, if you would like to experience a 10% discount on your next car move, go to ReliableCarriers.com, uh, click on Get a Quote, and... In the comments section, mention the Carmudgeon Show, ideally with some kind of, I don't know, plug. That's probably not useful. But I mean, I don't kinda, say don't say mean things, at least. I, I kind of feel like, look, the whole point of sponsorship is, right, We they're, they're, they're trading exposure, right? They want us to get them extra business. And really, there should be like some sort of cookie and a tracker and electronic thing. But if you have to go and do this in the in the sort of comment section of the sign up thing, I kind of feel like you should make it worth your time. Hmm. Interesting. Like, I'm not saying be profane, but I am saying like those dumb humanoids, <laughs> those dumb carmudgeons made me do this, or just give the poor person who's reading that form a giggle. I got. I hope. Hope reliable. No mad at us for saying that. <laughs> yes. Like I said, don't say anything. You know, traumatic. Don't traumatize. Don't anyone. traumatize anyone. But I think it's kind of important. Like you know, the Carmudgeons told me you would take care of my 1987 Chevy Cavalier. <laughs> you could ship that. Yes, you could. Uh, that would be sort of a high achievement if you could spend more on transport than you paid for the car. I've done that. Have you? Mm -hmm. I once shipped the Scirocco from the Midwest to California. And the bill was... Oh, well, you paid like $1,528 for $1,530 or $730. $1,530. And the transport back in the days, a long time ago, was $2,700 enclosed, heated. I was absolutely certain. That's, still, yeah. that's like still kind of what it cost to go cross-country enclosed. Yeah, I didn't want to. I didn't care. I didn't care what it cost. It was my baby. And the, the great part was when the guy picked up the car. I wasn't there when he picked it up. And I uh, picked it up and said, if this f was a friend of mine who was loading it on, in the car with him, he said, if this guy's spending this kind of money to move this car, I ain't touching it. He moved all the Ferraris and everything else out. Uh, my buddy drove the Scirocco in, turned it off. He said, leave the key in the ignition. I'm not starting it. I'm not looking at it. The guy covered it and then put all the Ferraris and other like expensive cars around it. And it showed up perfect. And I drove it off the truck because he was like, mm -mm, you're something wrong with you. <laughs> anyway, uh, but the car reliably made it here. So there you have it. All right. 10% off. On reliable carriers for your enclosed transport. This is the time when the... Oh, yes. Is it time for us to make new music? Mm, no, it's now part of our identity. Yeah, let's hope that 64 song from last week wasn't ever part of... I don't... Never again. Thank you. Eric, I know you don't think you're a teenager or a millennial or a gen, whatever the hell you are. Put your phone down. Put your headphones on. We have a podcast to do. What you guys can see offline is that Derek is always on his phone like some sort of lovesick teenager. Are we recording? Yeah. Paolo's Egg. learning. <laughs> Egg. Well, this has been episode 65. Uh, <laughs> no, you don't. Uh, do we need to address the elephant in the room? Uh, the new TV? Mm -hmm. The TV that broke in the middle of the last episode. Sam, well, I Sam. like the improved, new and improved <laughs> signage. <laughs> <laughs> I like your solution, which is handwrite a note. The Carmudgeon Show, no girls allowed. <laughs> That's very Dennis, of, Dennis the Menace of you. Yes. Um, yeah, so Samsung has, uh, has received a warranty ticket from me ah. and that's the furthest I've gotten. Very that, productive. That lasted what? Four months? April, May, June. Yeah. Four months. And it got a total of maybe, I don't know, 10 hours of use. No, because we do four oh, episodes I I, a week. Yeah, I, see I mean, a, a month. There's a lot. Four episodes a day. 
<clears throat> if you're binging. Bonjing. Um, yeah, so we said something in the preview that we haven't recorded yet about things we're going to talk about today. Um, which are little. 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 Not a lot of displacement. Hold on. 660 cc's times 3. 6 times 3 is 18 plus 90. 1,900. 1.9 liters. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, yeah, I had currently, so, you know, these episodes are delayed. They're not exactly recorded as, as you see them. They're not live. Although we've been talking about doing a live episode so you guys can interact with us. And once we have a screen, we could consider that again. Um, I'm currently in 1990, 1980s CCs. No, 2080. Is it 2080? 2070. If you think about it this way, just do 700 CCs times. Oh, hold on. 660. You said, yeah, not 690. Yeah. 660 would be 1800 plus yeah plus one point 1980 which is the displacement of my volkswagen oh look at that so you could have three k cars or one Mm -hmm. two liters volkswagen yeah uh with one third is no some sort of remaining valves 16 versus Mm. 12 times they're 36 three times 23 Three times three cylinders, nine cylinder, you, a two liter, nine cylinder engine. You do realize that people are watching us do, oh, doing this shit. math, right? Uh, well, like, then they can see the smoke coming it, out of our ears as just, we attempt to do mental math. They're screaming, just get your fucking calculator out and figure it out, you idiots. It's 1980 cc's and nine cylinders. Nine cylinders. That's. I was I was thinking about the, the total displacement of a K car engine, 600, the max that they're allowed is 660 cc's is smaller than a single cylinder on many V8s. Mm. Think about that. Eight times 648. Yeah. Any five liter V8 would have more displacement in each cylinder than a K car does. So, anyway, we're going to talk about K cars, uh, which are widely sporty ones. My wildly misunderstood category of vehicles. Okay. So, I've done and some research. Us. Yeah. Getting a preview uh, of an of an upcoming Revelations yes. episode. We're going to do a Revelations episode on the ABC cars. And so that was the AutoZam AZ1, the Honda Beat, and the Suzuki Cappuccino. Cappuccino. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so I'm doing, um, uh, you know, if you guys ever watch these Revelations show, hopefully you know that I do a ton of research on this. Um, and there's there's some stuff that is not quite regularly accessible in, in the English language. Like, for example... The history of the AutoZam AZ1 is in Japanese, thank God for Google Translate, uh, in all of the Japanese publications that I could find, uh, credit is given 100% to Mazda for development of that car. Now, AutoZam was a sub-brand of Mazda um, in the same way that you know Scion was a sub-brand of uh, Toyota. <clears throat> but uh, in English language uh, stuff, it's credit's given entirely to Suzuki. Huh. So, Those are not the same thing. Correct. Does so Mazda I, translate to Suzuki? No. If you put it through Google Translate? No. AutoZam was, uh, was, however, populated with other manufacturers' cars, including Lancia. Auto, AutoZam sold Lancias. Um, oh, as a distributor. Uh, yeah. I mean, a rebadge, a badge job. And AutoZam did sell a lot of Suzuki K cars. What bad, what Lancia Don't, model? I didn't look that up. I just saw it in a bunch of British magazines. Um, some sort of launcher. I'm sure the internet will tell us in the comments. Rebadged or it's a distributor Rebadged. selling them? Rebadged. Rebadged, Rebadged as, as autozams. Yeah. Well, that's terrifying uh, given uh, what I know about launches of that era. Well, I mean, Suzuki's. Although, you know, there was a Swift and the Sidekick and they were fine. And they're um, like durable, Japanese, sensible, not decompose while you drive cars. Unlike Lancia. Unlike sure. a Lancia. I mean, I've only ever driven a Delta Integrale, so that's my reference point for... Well, like, I haven't driven a, the, the Prisma and all the sort of more pedestrian cars, but the, like, Integrale, which was probably the most expensive Lancia you could buy the side of a Tama, uh, is not a high-quality car. I would argue that n- neither is the Tama. I mean, the, have you interacted with a Tama? No, but, I mean, I saw pictures of the interiors decomposing when they were new. Um... <laughs> I don't know. All the other Type 4, well, the 164 is okay. The Saab 9000 is pretty decent, but they heavily re-engineered that car. Right. So don't assume that these people know that Type 4... Type 4 is the thing they made four of. Fiat Chroma. That's the first one. The most important one is the Fiat Chroma. Is it though? <laughs> no, it's the, I think that's the least important one. Uh, and then the Lancia Tema and the Alpha 164 and the Saab 9000. All of which were the same car. And then the Saabs were pretty comprehensively re-engineered. The other three were pretty close, more closely related pretty cool uh the alpha is the only one that had the 24 valve v6 that sounds like a v12 
Mm-hmm. I you just get a found, twelve valve or twenty four valve. I just found a clip. I'm gonna have to fucking you could find get it. A as garbage an uh, GM V6 in the Saab nine thousand. You could, which was actually also twenty four valve. Was it yeah, not? Yeah. But it's not a Busso. Um, I found a video of the Busso that finally explains acoustically just how good that thing sounds. Because I've been fighting with... So Anthony, my director and my business partner who does all the icons and revelations and all the other stuff with me, um, he's like autistic levels of uh, sound recognition. You can play a video clip and he's like, mm, yeah, it's an S85, but it's got short, a shorter exhaust. So it's an M6, not an M5. Like he's just that good, instantly. And I can, I, he and I have spent hours upon hours upon hours, you know, like two o'clock in the morning, I'm just playing clips on YouTube. And he's like, that's an odd fire uh, Gallardo, but there's an even fire, uh, there's got odd fire Huracan, but an even fire Gallardo in the background. And you're like, what? And he would literally do that level of shit. And he's like, wait a second, hold on. RX-7 drove by, but the car you want me to do, that's an LS, but it's an LS7. And he's just unbelievable. Anyway, I kept telling him that the 164, you and I test drove a 164 with a 24 valve, and it was the best sounding six cylinder I've ever heard. And he was like, yeah, no, I don't like Busos. And I finally found a clip that I played for him, and he's like, what is it? And I'm like, the first thing I ask him if when he can't immediately identify a car is cylinder count. Like, what is it? And he's like, ah. Uh. I'm like, I played it again. And he's like, mm. Like, is it a six or a 12? And he's like, ah, I think it's a six. The fact that he thought it was a six, but it could be a V12. And I kept playing it. He's like, I've never heard anything like that. I don't know what that is. It was a 24 valve. What engine Uso. or what, what car was it in? Uh, one of the hatchback cars. I so think. it was a 3.2. So it, it was a 3.2 transverse. Transverse um, Bussos sound better than longitudinal yeah, ones to me. Weird. It shouldn't be that way, but they yeah. do. Um, the other weird thing is that he would do, we've got to get him on the show one time, just video. He gets shy. He doesn't like to be in front of the camera, but, uh, he often can't tell, uh, Volkswagen R32s apart from, from VQ36s, um, yeah. uh, V30, VQ35. Um, but yeah, he, he has a hard time telling them apart and I thought he was crazy and then he quizzed me and I was 50%. I was right half the time. Which, which means this, there was random. No, yeah. Um, there's a little bit, the slight differences at low revs if you can hear them apart. But yeah. Anyway, um, <clears throat> how the fuck did we get here? Because we were talking about K cars, we're talking cylinder counts. And we, then we went down a Type 4 thing. And then we, we have to mention the 832. We can't talk about the Type 4 without <sighs> mentioning the 832. But now we've mentioned it, so we can move on. The Lodge 832. Do you really want to move on or do you want to talk about it? i've never driven one i've heard they're not Neither. that great to drive but they Who sound cares? great it's got a cross plane ferrari v8 engine in it. <clears throat> yeah it's uh they put a transverse front wheel drive ferrari v8 car together it's fucking around with a really great rear spoiler that retracts into the trunk lid have you seen the way the rear spoiler works i don't think i have oh so when it's down it's just the trunk lids flush and then the what is the panel that sort of it looks like a sunroof but it's on the trunk and then that panel comes up and that becomes the top of the wing and extends out of the top oh of the trunk lid. I have to have one of these. I need to go drive one. I'm sure I they're I think terrible. it'll be disappointing to drive. Of course it's terrible. Uh, of course it's disappointing. It's a front-wheel drive full-size sedan. What could possibly With a V8 go right? in it. Yeah, yeah, it's like a um, Cadillac with a North Star. Yeah, but it's smaller than that. It's more like a, a Chevy... What the hell was it? What was the sedan version oh, of the Monte Carlo? Oh, they made an Impala. Like yeah, a with transverse, transverse V8. V8. Mm-hmm. Jesus. Yeah. Um, anyway, we were supposed to be talking about K cars. And so the other you, end of the spectrum, exactly the opposite. If you had to tell me, if you had to guess what the limitations were on, on the K car classification, what are they? Displacement. Okay. 660 CC max. Top speed. No, I guess they figured this is like group B where they're just like, oh, we'll put this limit and hopefully that will limit everything else. Mm. I'll explain that in a second. Other limitations? Uh, physical dimensions? Right. That was the primary. The primary, so the the idea of a K car started in 1949. I think the first regulation went into effect in 50. Um, and it was basically Japan's post-war economy wasn't doing so well. And the rest of the world started. I wonder started why that was. Because we bombed the shit out of them? Perhaps. Right, right. Um, and so to stimulate the economy and to mobilize 
the population because you know cars were not common um the japanese government set a tax preferred class of vehicles aside that would have a discount on their three taxes that you pay now i don't know if it was the same same way then but an acquisition cost basically a sales tax and then a weight tax and then um then there's another one like I don't remember what the third one was. Um, is that related to use or recurring, like registration? And it's sort of registration, but K cars aren't technically registered. But either way, they created a class of vehicles that had a big tax advantage. And the idea was these would be simple cars that people would be able to afford um, to, to mobile. There was a Fox, it was a Japanese Volkswagen, you know, car for the, for the people. Everybody did this right. at this but, time period. But what they did was create uh, limitations on it so that. Manu- motorcycle manufacturers would be able to use leftover parts that they had lying around. So the idea was originally, I think it was a 100cc limit on the engine, <laughs> which became 150, which then became 360. Um, mm, and Subaru the, 360. Right. And it, every year, there were changes every year that K-cars didn't work. And they, by the way, were mostly three wheels. Um, they did not have to be four wheels. And it wasn't until, I want to say 53, 54, 55, 56, that sort of era, so five years later, that Subaru came out with a, their 360, which sort of solidified the recipe for a K car, which was four wheels, very small engine, 360 CC engine. And then Honda came out with their N360. Um, <clears throat> but largely the, the class of vehicles was ignored up until that point. Um, because Ignored by consumers, ignored by manufacturers. Both. Because even though Suzuki was first to it, the cars didn't sell. They were too expensive and they were too slow and they were just, the regulations were too aggressive. Right? You can't have a hundred cubic centimeter engine. That's a my leaf blower which is not even gas powered, has a bigger gas engine than that. <laughs> I mean, a my electric season, leaf blower. My electric leaf blower has more displacement than that. Um, so it really sort of gelled at the at the four-wheel 360cc mark um, and then kind of grew from there. And for ye- uh, for years, um, the K cars were did did very well and then started to languish in sales. What um, era is this? This, this is like is the 70s? 60s right? and then 70s and into, into early 80s, they were not doing well. Uh, they had raised the displacement limit to 550 at one point. Um, but the real impetus came in in the 1990s. In the late 80s, uh, there was a 550cc limit, and that was then raised to 660. And that was the time when everything really woke up. So Japan finally um, was in an in a economic boom period, so people were doing well. Um, and when the when the manufacturers found out about the looming 660 cc regulations, which also came together with a length increase, um, fun shit started to hap- happen. And so the first to market was the Honda Beat. Um, second was the Suzuki Cappuccino, and third was AutoZam AZ1 in the class of. And this is all late eighties. Uh, this is ninety. They were all shown at, at between eighty five and eighty nine in concept form, um, and then went into production shortly thereafter. Beat was ninety. Uh, late 90, early 91, I think. Um, a lot like then, the NSX. Mm-hmm, yeah, same basic time. Also pin and Farina styled. Mid-engined. Mid-engined. Manual. Independent throttle bodies. Five-speed manual. A um, lot, of, lot of parallels between Beat and NSX, uh, including 40 millimeter shift throw. But, <laughs> um, but it's sort of common lore that uh, the K class has a, uh, a mandated speed limit and a power limit. Like everyone will tell you that K cars all have to make less than 64 PS or German, you know, or metric horsepower. Um, yeah. Um, but it's not the case. In fact, there is no regulation about top speed or um, horsepower. And horsepower. that I thought, yeah, there's no regulation. What? That is a self imposed limit by JAMA, the Journal of American Medicine Association. <laughs> no, Japanese Auto Manufacturers Association. <laughs> Um, interestingly enough, they, the car company, the Japanese car companies started to recognize that cars, they were entering a horsepower war, surprisingly. And they came up with a gentleman agreement that we know now in, for the 280 horsepower car, that was because the most powerful car sold in Japan was 280 horsepower. That's where that number came from. They took that. What, what car was that? It was the, I think it was GTR. That makes sense. GTR. Um, whatever it was, they said, okay, this is it. This is the limit. And they sort of all the manufacturers, all the members of JAMA um, shook hands and said, no more than, um, no more than 200. I think it's 280 horsepower. Yeah, that sounds right. right. I think I've seen it as 276, mm-hmm. like American, Met, horsepower, American horsepower, horsepower and yep. 280. And at the same time, they also actually agreed on a top speed. So all Japanese market cars are limited to 180 kph. 
Uh, and that was not because the fastest car could yeah, do one. Yeah, that's why the NSX Type R is t- uh, speed, uh, the speed needle, <laughs> speedometer. <laughs> we, we just had lunch and we should, we should know better. We should never record after lunch because we're both like half like food speed coma. Speed needle ends at 180. <laughs> Does it, the tack only goes to 180? Speedometer. <laughs> the speed needle goes to what? Start this episode over. I'm so like I'm gonna take a nap. We should just stick a fork in it and call it done. Welcome to the next episode of Naps with Jason and Derek. Uh, um, yeah, uh, mm. yes. But the 180 was actually not chosen arbitrarily. Interestingly, the thought was that cars that could do 180 on level ground um, would be able to manage 100 and 100 kilometers an hour, which was the national speed limit at the time, on a six percent grade. Huh. So they thought if we make the limit 180 and the cars are engineered to do 180 at their actual VMAX, they'd still be able to do at least 100 on the, on the motorways on a 6% grade, which is like fucking really, like, wow. Who thought of this? Well, Jama did. I mean, um, this is like the braking requirements for British cars and about how the, the car had to be able to... <laughs> Uh, the whole thing with the McLaren F1 brakes was that it had to be a- the brakes had to be able to slow the car down from what was it some percentage of its V max right. some number of times and so the braking compounds were designed for that which is why the brakes at low speeds in those cars are normal speeds in that cars are those cars are a little bit like like that's probably one of the most efficient areas of the McLaren F1 are the brakes hmm. that when people are upgrading them now for usability they upgrade the brakes usually because the braking compounds were designed for really high speed application and so that they're, they're too uh hard right for normal so when use. you say deficient you mean in usability not performance correct right. yes there yes that's deficient a very in performance and deficient yes in, assuming you're going 0.8 times 231 miles an hour 0.9 or whatever the mm, number is that's crazy but yeah so that 180k 280 horsepower rule applies to regular cars k car it's the same thing there is no power limitation but there was a suzuki alto works um, something works. I think it was an Alto Works. That was a turbocharged 666, uh, 660cc engine that made 64 horsepower. And that was what that was the most powerful. And they said, okay, that's it. So now we are going to, as an, as an industry, self-regulate the maximum power to 64 PS, 64 metric horsepower. Um, Did, and the I've, speed limit was... Go ahead. And they've also sort of self-imposed a 150K uh, top speed. For the for those cars because they felt any one fifty one fifty not I don't that's some good. of them do one fifty the current Honda S six sixty uh, which is the which is a, a modern beat does well, I think it's one fifty it's ninety four miles an hour um, only but, yeah but then is it limited or limited yeah but most of the like the nineties the ABC cars are all one thirty five one forty in that range and that's just so well, that's like 80 miles an hour. It's yeah, a little more than 83, I think. 135, so it's 87. Is that ge- done with gearing? No, electronic limiter huh. on all of them. I know. Does yours have that? Mm-hmm. You hit it. You didn't even notice that's it. Right. The engine note goes from wah to wah, rah, rah. It sort of cuts, it must cut spark. Yeah, um, interesting. Yeah. But uh, and did they honor that? Because I know that with the 280 horsepower limit, that was often disregarded, especially like with the R34 Skyline, very definitely mm-hmm. not 280 horsepower. It's really interesting because the I've not yet driven a cappuccino. So I found one for the for the shoot. Can't wait to meet this owner and the car. Um, I have the Autozam AZ1 in my possession. It's in the studio right over there. I'm aware. And uh, you I drove it. I yes. uh, hope he's allowed to. I'm kidding. Um, Uh, AZ1 is a turbo 64 horsepower uh, car and the Beat is a naturally aspirated independent throttle body. 64 horsepower car. The difference between those two cars accelerative capabilities is let's come up with a comparison. Well, I'm just trying to think like the difference between a GTI and a friggin McLaren. I mean, no contest. The Beat has to be 12s, 12 and a half, 13 seconds to 60 and that car is at 8. What in the fuck was that? Oh, somebody's outside. Yeah, moving that trailer that's blocking our parking spot. Uh, sorry about the background noise. Um, yeah, the difference in, I mean, I th- I did a sort of seat of the pants video of acceleration of the two, and I should put them together, but I think the zero to top speed run, and top speed the same on both of the car, both those cars, was like 30-something seconds in the, let's call it 35 seconds in the beat and 25 seconds in the mm-hmm. AZ1. I mean, just... It's the difference, I would say, having driven both of those cars between 
like Shit. usable in in America and like not quite usable. So the beat. <laughs> I mean, the, it's usable. The like a Vanagon is usable. A, right. a, a, a diesel, old diesel Mercedes is usable. But you are matted yes. the whole time. And in the in the beat, the engine is very vocal. It's very guttural. It's, it's very, working very hard. Right. You hear everything and you have to rev the shit out of it to, to go anywhere. The AutoZam, the engine's quiet and it's smooth. Comparatively quiet. I would say I would consider that. I mean, you can hear it. You can hear it, but it's not. I mean, the, the engine is the centerpiece of the Honda Beat. Without question, everything whether you want it or not, exactly. And your the gears are so short that you're at seven thousand RPM plus on the highway, just mercilessly beating this thing, keeping it doing seventy miles an hour. The Autozam very different, yeah. huge wave of mid range torque. Yeah, um, the turbo kicks in by twenty five hundred RPM. You're at full boost. Yeah, I found myself short shifting it because mm -hmm. I just didn't need it, which is a sign of something that you have in a powerful car. Whereas in the beat, it's like, oh, gotta rev it out because I need to go someplace. Whereas this thing on it, like, because you were like, oh, ninety three hundred cut off. And like I was not paying attention to that, and then I was like, oh, I should probably rev it out once. Uh, and I was like, oh wow, this goes on for quite a long time, which means that I was, you know, doing the thing that one does in like an E ninety M three, which is you shift when you like sort of feel like you should, and then if you actually pay attention to the tack, you're like, oh, I'm leaving two thousand RPM on the table. Right. This does something similar. You can't do that in the beat because it has no power, so you have to rev it out always. I mean, it also makes power peak at eighty. The beat makes its power peak at eighty one hundred, and its torque peaks at seven thousand. I think. So it's not. I mean, you're it's highly strong. You're yeah. And naturally, you're gonna you're gonna want to shift where torque starts to drop off um, mm -hmm. significantly, and that's not the case on the beat, but it is the case on the AZ1. I mean, it does pull pretty damn hard to nine grand, uh, but you're not gonna accidentally hit the limiter <laughs> in, in that. Uh, Correct. But it's got a huge. I mean, your turbos have tiny little operating ranges usually, especially port injected early '80s turbos and '90s turbos. Usually, you know, like you can something like a Saab nine nine hundred. Not, I mean, that's why those cars in turbocharged form have like 20 more horsepower with a turbo versus not. Right, because they're they're filling in the mid-range and then there's nothing up at top. This is the opposite. This thing is, I mean, genuinely quick from 3,000 RPM all the way to 9. You know what else I drove recently that had that characteristic which really surprised me was the um, Peugeot 205 Turbo 16, actually. Huh. We have a new video coming out about that. But the thing that most impressed... Shameless plug... Much. Oh, as if we you haven't done that already this episode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I haven't done my video yet. I can't plug something that hasn't happened. I'm totally kidding. Um, that car pulls to 7,000, which is like when, I think when Redline is, and despite being turbocharged, and it really like doesn't run out of breath at the top end, which is surprising it, for something with CIS. What's it like down low, though? Mm, nothing. Hmm. See, that's what, like, very much like a, a Subaru WRX STI does. Yes. Nothing, yes, nothing, yes, nothing. Yes. Four and then grand. Light switch. Right. Blast off. From four, four to seven thousand bucks, four to sixty-five, nine thirty. Oh, port, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Do we need a nap? Um, yeah, yeah. Same thing. But the amazing thing about that cappuccino motor, uh, that cappuccino motor is the AZ1 motor, um, is that it just pulls from. I mean, it's one of the biggest operating bands of any turbocharged engine I've ever experienced. Yeah, that's not a like one of these modern computer-controlled variable geometry. Even them. I mean, you know, you're you're talking about like I guess the the best example there would be BMWs. The S58 is way too laggy. The B58, which is the sort of 40i motor, makes a lot of power, but you get a big boom of of boost at some point. This what about the uh, three-liter turbo in the Porsche. Porsche? That's pretty good. Yeah. That's a pretty good one. You do get, I mean, you do get a whack of torque uh, from two to three grand, and it's the same in the kept in the AZ one, except you're never at two or three grand. You're always at four, five, six, seven. Yeah. Um, what a cool car! But so yeah, how about ergonomically? Oh, for fuck's sake! I I fit in everything, right? I'm I'm five foot ten and a half on the dot, or I would just say it was five eleven. Um, I'm broad, but I'm typically I'm just sort of normal like. 60th percentile american male in proportion and and in you know height uh that that one's tough that it's interesting tough. because our heights are not that different and i did not find the car ergonomically problematic at all like you're like oh get in this thing you're, you'll be amazed you can't see the hvac and you can't like your leg is doesn't fit under the steering wheel and the, on the clutch pedal at the same time and i was like it's fine it like, was so weird literally. watching you fall right into that cabin because we're we I can drive any car that's in your driving position and vice versa, right? I don't have to move. I typically go one click further back on a yes. seat than you do. Um, I've noticed that every time I get in, you get in one of my cars or vice versa, I have to go back one click. But 
this is a very clear cliff. It's not a, it's not a curve. It's a cliff. I don't fit and you do. Yeah. And we're within a half an inch of height. You're 5'10", right? Yeah. Yeah. So weird. I mean, we measured earlier and I think my hip is, I think my legs are probably an inch or two longer than yours. And I think that's where it is. But when I'm in that seat, like the seat, the steering wheel is offset so that the right side of the, the three o'clock position of the, of the wheel is, it's this way, right? Yeah. No, other way around. It's one way. Well, fucking. I think I the, the right side is closer. Too. Right side is closer. And then the whole thing is offset like so that the, the steering column is way left of your left nipple or mine anyway. I don't know where yours is. Um, <laughs> and then the, the pedals are offset to the left. It's, it's a pretty compromised seating position. But the big issue for me is that my leg in a straight line, my lower leg makes, is triangulated between the clutch, the center console and the steering wheel. It's yes. hitting all three. Yeah. And there's no way to avoid that. And yeah, so, and I have that issue not at all in that car. It's so weird. And it doesn't block the HVAC for me. Mm-hmm. It doesn't touch the console. Yeah. I, I, I can fit just under the steering wheel. It's so weird that just a half an inch of difference is enough yeah. to... Look, I can drive the car. It's not like I, I, you know, I got in and said, oh, I can't drive this. Um, but the Beat is like, you know, the same size on the outside, night and day. Like the Beat, I don't even have the seat all the way back. I have it a couple clicks further forward. Um, and Honda made an asymmetrical cabin in that car. So the, the driver's to the right side is an inch wider, I think, than the, than the left. And it's wide and, you know, the passenger seat is more cramped, but you fuck the passenger, who cares? Um, yeah, I find it so interesting that the packaging can be so different on that, those two cars. And the, I mean, and then in my case, it just doesn't matter. I fit in both yeah. fine. <laughs> Funny. This is one of the few cars that I've ever driven where I thought, mm, I don't, I, I, I can make it work. I don't want to. Yeah, I have, and I have this conversation oftentimes when I'm selling a car to someone who's tall, like a 328 or 308, and someone's like, I'm 6'4", can I fit in this car? And it's like, mm, you want to put a sp- steering wheel spacer. If you put a steering wheel spacer to bring the steering wheel slightly closer to you, you'd probably be okay, because then you'd lose the third point of the triangulation, mm-hmm. which is your knee hitting yeah, the, the steering, steering wheel. wheel. Yeah. So pu- putting a you know 30 millimeter spacer on the steering wheel would probably solve the problem well, assuming case, you're not doing t-rex driving well and the, the autism also if you can there you, there's no way but the steering column is also way too low you, you commented yes, on it right i away. noticed this that i couldn't see the top of the tack i can't see the top more than a third of all the gauges i mean i mean yeah. you you joked that the, the tachometer is about the size of a wristwatch yes, and it's really we have not, the photo we have the photo um yeah, I just... I, That's I, the thing about those cars generally is that they're proportioned pretty well such that when you look at them in photos, you're like, oh, it's like a well-proportioned car. And then you're like, oh, wait, these are 12-inch wheels. The car is actually tiny in this. That you, there are 14s on that Autozam. Oh, 13s on the front me. of the beat. Yeah. Um, no, so you, you get in limitation. You, you, and you see it in real life. You're like, oh, this thing is actually tiny. And then you hold up like a wristwatch next to the tachometer. And you're like, wow, it is actually like a legitimately tiny car. And what are their cars? Like Lotus, the first generation Lotus uh, Elans are like this also. Mm-hmm. So are Miuras, where you look at it in a photo and it's so well proportioned that you don't realize how small the car is until you interact, interact with, with one it. in person. Yeah. Um, I loved getting into the beat and realizing that, you know, having pictures, seen pictures of it for years and now owning one, um, it was a bit of a shock because everything looks typical Honda. The key looks Honda. The, the shifter looks like a Honda. It's all familiar stuff. The steering wheel looks like an NSX steering wheel, but it's all smaller. Yeah. So they they it's were all scaled down. Everything is scaled down. The key is shorter. <laughs> like I went and got a Honda key blank. It's like an inch longer. And I'm like, wait, is it still works? But now it sticks out like another. It's so wild. And the shifter looks just like a regular Honda shifter. And then I got my buddy's Del Sol. And I'm like, wait a second. It's twice the size. It's so crazy. Yeah. They just scaled everything down <laughs> and hoped no one would notice. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I love doing all the research on the K cars because, first of all, it's not pronounced fucking key car, which drives me crazy. Do people I say that? Constantly. Um, it's K. Who says uh, that? I hear that all the time. You never heard that? Mm-hmm. I'm always like, ugh, like, I'm sorry. It's your job as an enthusiast to learn how to pronounce things properly. Like, don't say Porsche. Say Porsche and say K car. So K Judisha. Judisha. Whatever. I don't, I don't remember what the word for car is. And it, mean, it means light. Basically, it's a light car classification um but i love that the sort of in the lore has become you know, every article i read was like the, the you know it has exactly the mandatory maximum horsepower it's not mandatory it's it's a gentleman's it's agreement. mandatory from the perspective of manufacturers rather it's, than the regulation it's self-regulated right it's in a gentleman's agreement and here's the reality and i can't wait to write the script for this revelation no one is a gentleman 
Everyone's a fucking cheat. Well, and yeah, that's so why the AutoZam definitely has a lot more. I power. wish I had time to dyno, dyno that car. Oh, I wish I had time to do that. What about a drag race? I mean, we could do that. We can go get the beat. Yeah. And then there's no, there's no, it's fucking different leagues. Yeah. yeah. And, and look, tur- you race a 200 horsepower turbo car against a 200 horsepower naturally aspirated car, and you're going to see a difference. Right. You could take, for example, like an, a 2008 Civic Si with a K20 and it was 195 horsepower and a GTI of the same vintage was also 200 horsepower. And there was a half a second or two thirds of a second difference to 60, not a five second difference. And there's a fucking five second difference between those two cars. There is no way, no fucking way that that AZ1 makes sense. No, I mean, much. it's a totally transformed experience. Like I said before, it's a difference between like with the beat feeling like Ooh, it's maybe a little bit marginal for road use. Whereas this is just like, yeah, this is like, a I don't know, Miata NA maybe. Yeah, I, I kept like finding myself on the highway on that thing last night doing 125K. Like no problem. It's at 5,000 or 4,500 RPM. The engine's quiet. It's got a lot of torque. And then I drove the beat home last night. And I'm like, kept finding myself doing 100K. And I'm like, oh, I don't want to go any faster. I don't know. I'm at 6,000 RPM. I think 5,000 is 92 kilometers an hour or something in that car. So 50 something miles an hour is. I guess that's why those cars are valued differently. Well, that and one has gold wing doors. Well, it's, it's you know, the, the single most important thing in Rarity. valuation is. is hmm? Rarity. Rarity. They made th- 3,000 and change versus 30,000. No, 5,000 and change versus 30,000. 33,000 beats, 5,000 something AZ ones. Mm. AZ ones were the last to the boot. So interestingly, I can't find out. You'll have to watch the revelations for this because which does not yet exist. Which does not soon yet exist. Will. I can't figure out who did the development of this car. So in 1985, Suzuki came out with a concept car that was a mid engine rear drive K car, sports car. Uh, then in 87, they came out with a second one. I don't they probably came out with a van that had exactly the same <laughs> configuration, rear, mid-engine, well, rear-wheel drive. That engine was from the front-wheel drive, front-engine car. That mm. was, And that was also available as a truck. with the six, It was a 64-horsepower motor. Um, that's the engine that created the 64-horsepower gentleman's agreement, right? Um, but they abandoned the plans for a mid-engine, rear-drive sports car and instead did the cappuccino. They went front-engine, front engine, rear-drive. Mazda, which was in bed with Suzuki for all the other K cars under the AutoZam brand, then the, the story that I think is most likely to have been the case is that Mazda then picked up where Suzuki had left off in the research um, and then finished development on this. Now, Mazda says the chief engineer for the car was the same guy who did the, the NA Miata. Um, so we'll find out because I have a call in to Tom Matano, who is the father of the Mazda and he was there so he emailed me back he was there he's happy to talk about it and I just my question is very simple like who's your daddy like who did who actually is responsible for this car um and my guess is that the initial uh concept and probably the early engineering was done by Suzuki and then it was finished by Mazda even though the AutoZam AZ1 was built by Suzuki Uh, for Mazda for Mazda but there was a Suzuki version Cara C-A-R-A Suzuki Cara was I think they made 300 of those or 500 of those Really? I don't know, Same car. Story. Same car. That's the Suzuki. Really? But, yeah. but that was, huh. even though that was really the first of the three ABC cars in concept, because again, that concept car was from 1985 was when this whole thing started. Um, the Beat was the first. So it wouldn't, to market. To market. So it wouldn't surprise me to find out that Honda saw what Suzuki was doing and said, oh, hell no. And they, they started development of the Beat, which was the first to market. Suzuki switched which from you know mid-engine rear drive to front-engine rear drive and uh, thus were delayed and that was the cappuccino and then the final was the az1 and the az1 which took, was actually the first <laughs> which was actually the first and that took an additional two years because they switched the chassis over from aluminium to steel at one point in the development and that apparently delayed it quite some time mm. um like the um lfa like the lfa which was 10 years late no yeah. 10 years total not 10 years late. Oh, it had to be 10 years late. How long did that? 10 year total It was 10 year total development time. That's it? Yeah. That doesn't seem that long. I mean, the problem with that car is they showed it too friggin' early. You can't yeah, when tease it was the something LF- up. A, mm-hmm. And then it became the LFA. I just got bitch slapped by a guy who works for Lexus for using a hyphen. Oh, yeah. Like you don't use never, a hyphen unless it's the concept car. I know. I fucking always forget that. I always call it LF. Oh, but it's technically space, right? Oh, is it? This is like the Mercedes 300 SEL on is the W109. There is a space between the SE and the L. No. 
Yes. Oh, I didn't know that one. Yeah, we'll get the insert. This totally drives me nuts when, you know, when you work for a magazine, for example, Mini's brand is all capital. Mm-hmm. Do you follow that or do you no. just say, no, I mean, it's, you know, it's sort of against style guide, but then you have a Mercedes, let's call it a S420. Is there a space between the S and the 420? I usually don't so that it's easier to locate stuff when I'm Googling it. Right. However, in Mercedes documentation, there is always a space between like CLS space 63 mm. space formatic plus AMG, blah, 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 whatever crap. But anyway, um, this is the kind of stuff that drives magazine people crazy is how do we format things? Mm-hmm. Um, how do you write Mark from Mark one, Mark two, Mark three? Um, it depends what the car is. Well, I just saw in Haggerty's very own uh, Haggerty Driver Club magazine, which I had on the table. Um, they did one of the one of the freelancers, I think it is, did a did a thing on Shirok sixteen valve, and I I did answer a bunch of his questions on the car, and they used photos of my car uh, for the article. Um, and I said to him, "It's MK two, sp- it, with an it's M of capital M lowercase K, no space the the numeral two. And I saw right at dot. Huh? Is there a dot after the K? Mm-mm. Just MK2 is this sort of Volkswagen community speak. And he used a Roman numeral two. Not he, someone, one of the people in the edit used a Roman numeral two. Wrong. That works for Jaguar, right? Yeah, but you see both ways. Mm. But yeah, I would say more likely with Jaguar, you would use Roman numerals for series one, two, and three for E-types and XJs and also Mark one, one two. Right. Uh, there was no three. There was a four and five and, and then seven. Lincolns are spelled eight, out M A R K. Yes. Yeah, that's right. Stupid. I mean, it's, well, this is the shit that drives, you, you guys didn't even think about. Don't work for a magazine. You're gonna have to deal with all this bullshit. And then you have you know all the hard work that goes into Haggerty Drivers Club magazine. And then there's some schmuck in a studio with a broken television going. Yeah, I want an M K Arabic number two, not Roman number two. Whatever. Is it Arabic? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Look at me. I remember second grade. Second grade. Uh, That's like a fifth or sixth really? grade. I was very advanced. Um, okay. K cars. Yes. Um, so you've now driven Biat mm-hmm. and you've driven AZ1. Have you driven Cappuccino? I have not. Okay. Can't wait. I'm super, I am super excited. intrigued. The uh, period. Think road, it's going to, I think it's going to be closer to the beat. I, I think so too. Um, the period road test criticized the AZ1 of having tremendous suspension um, uh, camber changes throughout. That I did notice. It was kind of alarming. Yeah. You're kind of like pogoing along with this weird... The weird like, thing is it feels like one of the shocks... Or yes. One, it feels like the right rear shock is blown. But if you press down on the back of the car, it does a perfect... Symmetrical you know rebound. What, you know what the, what you're feeling? Because the beat does the same thing. Your own weight. Oh, my own your, fat Your ass. 170 or whatever pounds you weigh on the right-hand side is just enough to totally change the way that... The, the right rear of that car behaves it. So you get oh, this. You got to ride roll. two up. Yeah. You don't need to have a passenger of exactly the same size and weight as you, which means we can never ride together. Uh, but um, yeah. So apparently the thing is very easy to spin because of the short wheel base. Obviously the driving position is not helping someone like my size, um, but the camber changes, especially in the rear. And then you spin it and roll it and can't get out. Oh, geez. because the door's done. And it's got the tiny little uh, mail, mail slot windows. Mm-hmm. Can't get out. And then uh, that doesn't have explosive door bolts like an SLS. No, and the other issue was that the spare tire. Can't you just push the door open and then I'll roll the car over. I mean, it weighs fifteen hundred and something pounds. <laughs> yeah, just if you push can do the that. door open and it'll <laughs> roll the car over. Yeah, that happens. I'm a little bit nervous to drive that on the on the mountain road. I think I'm going to go pretty pretty mild on that car. I mean, the beat. I'm not. I, I mean, I've slid the beat around a couple corners and I haven't really gone crazy with it. Um, I don't think I'm going to go too, too nuts on that AZ one. I mean, it's it's a little bit. Alarming. Hairy. Yeah. Mm. Even just on the highway, you sort of get. Yes, this, on the highway, you yeah. do get into this harmonic mm-hmm. um, Dutch roll. oscillation. Yeah. Did you learn that term from me? Yes, I did. Yeah. It's great. Would you it, like to explain what that means? Dutch roll is. Uh, it's like an a airplane. type of bread with a crunchy thing on it. No, that's crunch. Dutch crunch. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dutch roll is an airplane term that was used to characterize airplanes that you get into this like oscillation that is both in the roll axis and the yaw axis. The roll. And the yaw. So you get this like Cadillac, <laughs> Cadillac motion. Yeah. yeah. Yep. So the car definitely uh, has some mm, oscillations. Yeah. You might get seasick in it. 
yeah. or air sick. It's a little, and the steering is really quick. Yeah. Really Wonderful, quick. actually. It's really magnificent. You think it's nervous? It's nervous. Yeah. It's not. I, I enjoyed it. My beat is more nervous, but I think my beat is broken. So I, I tried to go align it, and it doesn't fit on the alignment rack. It's too narrow. <laughs> so I need to go find someone with you a smaller a alignment rack. alignment yeah. rack. <laughs> fucking concept of that <laughs> oh, okay. um i think that alcohol that we drank at lunch is kicking in now now we're not just tired we're stupid um i think it's got toe out so which would would do so it sort of it yeah. doesn't want to go straight it sort of wants to fall over yes. to the left or right yes. and uh yeah, it's also. like being balanced on a beach ball yeah it's exactly what that feels like and and the az one's a little bit the same but the thing is the az one is okay until you get i don't know 30 degrees of lock and then it feels like the steering ratio changes and tightens and the, man that thing goes around corners like yeah, it's like falling off a beach yeah. ball um yeah ass over tea kettle ass over tea kettle um but yeah i love that uh, i love that the internet is wrong about the horsepower and the speed limits i also love that i love the whole idea that we think as a society that we determine what we like in cars and actually it's so much of it is decided for us with economics 40% of all cars on the road in Japan are K cars. 70% mm, mm -hmm. mm, of the cars sold in America are SUVs. Do we really think those are? Uh, I mean, things? yes. So this is that classic, now classic. I don't. I actually don't think it's actually is classic, but we have talked about it before, which is to say that the products that are offered shape consumer preferences because you can funnel consumers into buying certain things by not giving them appealing alternatives right and this is definitely what happens with suvs and it's a chicken egg thing uh, to some extent also uh, but if you look at like the station wagon set up in the market versus suvs you're like why on earth would you spend extra money for a jetta wagon when you can get a tiguan that has more features for less money how many syllables like are in tiguan tiguan three <laughs> How many is it? Tiguan. Tiguan. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I mean, Tiguan is funny. Er, <laughs> they're both bad names, but Tiguan. What about Iguana? It's, Iguan. It's Tiguan. Okay, it's, yeah, it's in German. Souls. Okay. Um, Tiga, which is tiger, and Leguan, which is uh, iguana. <laughs> Dumbest fucking name ever. Um, uh, but yes, so the 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 consumers are buying things because there are sort of economic incentives where you would have to be genuinely enthusiastic and slightly irrational to buy the non-SUV uh, alternative. Mm -hmm. Which is why, and so basically the, you know, we can look at Japan as a curiosity and say this, this market is so weird. Why are these people driving these itty bitty tiny little cars? But it, there's an advantage to it. And it's the same, it, it, there was one Japanese, I think it was a Wikipedia page that I tra translated in English and it said the predominant car for mommies picking up their children at school is the minivan. Um, and I just, like, and it said like the desire to own an SUV is, is inherent in every individual in the U S or something like whatever. So they, you know, like we look at their K cars and we're like, wow, this is crazy. This is wacky. These cars are, whether you like them or not. And I always think they're so cool because they're just so different. And so I love the sense of humor that yes. Japanese culture has in design. Um, but they're looking at us the same way, like, oh, this is inherent in Americans. Every American wants an SUV. Not this fucking American. Um, but th both of those things, I am certain, happened because of economic incentives. Yes. And, I mean, cars like that, cars generally are representations of that. I mean, we talked about tax horsepower, for example. Mm -hmm. There's nothing intrinsic about British people which makes them want long-stroke motors that don't rev. <laughs> it's got to be some off-color joke we could make there i'm sure the co the comment section can provide uh and there's nothing about i don't know maybe there is something intrinsically cultural about italians who want high revving naturally aspirated engines they're fucking drama fans yeah but yeah, yeah but really it's tax structure that that did that and the same thing with suvs in the u.s i mean the 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 fact of the matter is suvs are not considered passenger cars under a lot of the oh, DOT yes. regs. And so they you get not, a lot of uh, exemption and less structure and, and oversight. And up risk. until recently, they were not subjected to the same crash tests as cars. And the, the, the automakers voluntary did, voluntarily did this because they obviously had some sort of conscience. But these SUVs exist. And the whole exemption to the fuel economy and emissions and safety regulations all exist because those were supposed to be farm vehicles. Yeah. Right? So... 
it's so much cheaper to develop an SUV in the, for the U.S. market than it is a sedan because you don't have to go through the certification. You can self-certify all the stuff that's not mandated by law, and thus they can be cheaper. Mm-hmm. Ta-da. And then so you train the market to want it, then you start charging a premium, and you double dip. You're making more money on a car that costs less to make. To make. Yeah. And that's exactly why every shit box in the parking lot outside is an SUV, except for the K-Car, which mm-hmm. has come from a culture that did the exact opposite. And the R129. Your bougie ass Mercedes, um, which, by the way, original price. Think of it. Think about the 129 though, and the existence of that car, and why it existed when it did. That was supposed to go into production in oh, 1982. Yes. yes, was delayed for almost 10 years because all the Cafe. automakers thought the no. Well, two two reasons. Firstly, all the automakers thought convertibles, convertibles were, were going to be outlaw in yeah. the U.S. and then. They were like a cafe, and so we need to switch all of our engineering resource not to a big, expensive convertible, but to a baby car. Right. That's but that car should thinking. have been in production far earlier than it was, and it was delayed and delayed and delayed because Mercedes wasn't going to invest in uh, replacing the R107 when they thought it was going to become illegal. And so that car, when they finally did do it in preparation or, I guess, to uh, as, a, as a hedge against any rollover regulations, it's created roll that rollover bar. Same reason why the Porsche Targa, the 911 Targa existed. That was a, a, was a way to, to be sure that, or at least to couch against U.S. rollover regulations. Same thing with the bitch basket handle on the Volkswagen Rabbit. Probably some structural. There's, there's for sure structural advantages, but that was done not because they wanted to. It was because they thought, okay, we're probably not going to be able to sell this in the U.S. And that becomes a selling. Like Everyone calls that car the bitch basket. It's called so it it because it's a basket with a handle that carries a bunch of bitches in it. That's just where, that's hey, I didn't make this up. That's an explanation of of the urban dic- urban urban dictionary definition of this. But that became a cultural thing in Germany. And then there's like chicken tax law too. So you get all of these like foreign trucks that w- wouldn't exist here or couldn't exist here. And then like one of my favorite things that is uh, a correlation or a it falls out of this effectively is the whole thing with sprinters. And how passenger sprinters were not, uh, so passenger were were allowed. Uh, and so what they would do, I think, was put seats in the vans. Because if it was a van, then it would be a working vehicle. And then it would be subject to the chicken tax laws. Which uh, duty is quite high. I forget what it is, 30% or something like that. Uh, and so then uh, they would put, the, put seats in them and they would come over as passenger vans and thus be exempt from the chicken tax. And then they'd take the seats out of them, ship them back to Germany and put them in the next batch that was coming over. So nuts. Uh, and then they, I think, start, they opened a plant in, in somewhere on the East Coast, I think in one of them, one of them Carolina states, I think. Uh, is where they started making because then if it's Alabama, built in Alabama, Kentucky. Uh, no, that's the Tuscaloosa plant yeah. for the uh, M- ML. Oh, there's a different. Uh, but there was remember. a plant that this is within the last f- maybe five, perhaps ten years, where they started making sprinters uh, in I think one of them Carolina states um, for <laughs> uh, to to get around the chicken right. tax because it's a domestically produced vehicle now. And I love that the chicken tax, the name of the chicken tax, came because this was a retaliatory tax, tax against the Japanese for. Japanese was it? I or thought Germans? it was a, chicken. No, there was. A, I thought it was the Japanese because Japan in, instituted a tax on imported chicken. Yes, uh, and this was a tax that we did as a retaliation yes. against pickup trucks. Yes, the whole against idea. foreign-made against trucks. Foreign-made trucks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so therefore, it's called the chicken tax. It's the same reason. It's the reason why the, Suzu, uh, the uh, Subaru Brat has two seats that will absolutely kill everyone in the back. But it was then because it had two seats in the back, it was a four seater and therefore not a utility truck and therefore was exempted from the chicken tax and saved 20, 30% tax. So fucking nuts. Mm-hmm. But I, you know, those are things that shaped one vehicle. The, Oh, I, you're I, talking about entire broad, entire broad forces. Right. Which is fascinating to me. I mean, what, what would our automotive fleet look? The K car doesn't work in the U S you know, a city like San Francisco, this the Bay Area, everything's very close together. Everyone drives relatively slowly. I mean, you know, when you're compared to like Texas or any other, or even New York, any other open spaces for sure. K cars don't work here. Um, but w- would they have? Like maybe they don't work in Japan either, but the tax, at, the tax incentives in the parking, that was the other thing, the parking. K cars are exempted from, in most places, in smaller cities, uh, so from in, the thing where they have to come out and measure your parking space and make sure right. you have somewhere to put your car. Right. That's a, most places are exempted for K cars. You don't actually register the car. You just go and do that. So if you get a white plate car, so I'm meaning a car with a, you know, an engine bigger than 660 cc's, um, 
you can't register the car until it's validated that you have a parking spot. I read it's either two kilometers or 800 meters from your primary place of residence that you have to demonstrate that you have a place to park it because you can't just park a car on the street. Um, in most cities with fewer than 100,000 uh, residents, K cars are exempt from that. And that's a huge benefit. You don't have to have, you know, someone come out and view verification. Yeah. Um, and then you save, you know, half. It was a, right. They, a couple of years ago, this is an interesting one. A couple of years ago, they removed a lot of the tax benefits from these cars. Really? Yeah. 2014. Um, and it's because the feeling was that, that so outsiders think of the, the K car market as a protectionist strategy for the, for the Japanese industry. So the Japanese are very, protect the japanese government is very protective of its industry for example cars get more expensive every year to to own rather than less expensive because they want people to take those cars scrap them and buy new ones and thus keeping you know keeping the factories humming um and the oh, which is the opposite of what we do here where things get progressively less expensive right less valuable less expensive less everything and then we and then we celebrate old certainly <laughs> you and i do celebrate old cars but the um it's really interesting that that protectionism isn't actually necessarily intentional but really it's not worth it for uh, for foreign manufacturers to to develop a car specifically for the japanese market it's too small to do that so what it does is means that you know the, the homegrown companies have a, a big advantage there because it's their market toyota i think toyota is like 70 percent market share in japan i was looking through seven of the top 10 best-selling cars in japan are toyotas it was like first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, eighth, and tenth. Or so like a un- staggering amount of Toyotas in the top ten list. Um, but the government had started to argue that actually these K cars were 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 pulling their the domestic manufacturers' uh, eyes off the balls, so to speak, mm-hmm. um, because they're spending too much resources developing these cars right, that are not be, saleable, and they should be focusing on the global market right. export. Okay. Yeah, really interesting. So they removed some of the benefits and there was a, a big backlash on this because the the people who drive K cars tend to be young, female, or old. Or all three. If you could if you could do <laughs> yeah, all three. Old and female at the same time. Are you not all three of those things? Okay. You're a ninety four year old woman in okay. in a thirty how old are you actually? In some other male body who's not ninety four years old. A young person's not my point is. Uh, those are the three demographics, demographics for K cars, and they typically tend to be people who do not make the, the lower income. And so, by increasing the taxes on these cars, you're really putting a burden on the poor. So you're penalizing mm-hmm. the poor. Mm-hmm. Um, but on the on the other hand, it works. These cars are, you know, they're cheaper to insure, they're cheaper to fix, they're cheaper to do inspections on. They get forty miles per gallon in the real world. I mean, they're just there's a real benefit to to limiting what these cars can do because we don't need four wheel drive 7000 pound 12 passenger 6 liter twin turbo v8 we have been trained SUVs. to think that we do yeah. it, it it depends where you are also every pretty much uh, i guess every country every fully developed country i think that has manufactured cars pretty much went through this phase of mobilizing the masses at some point i mean in the united states that would be the ford model t uh, obviously, the Volkswagen, Italy Fiat definitely 500. happened with the Fiat 500. And Japan and was the K cars. The K cars in Japan and in England, you get the uh, Austin 7 and Morris Minor, yeah. and then later on the Mini. Mm-hmm. But uh, they all have had that sort of develop the training wheels. Get you know, just get people yeah. at France. You get the Du Chevaux, right? Uh, but you basically are just getting people on wheels, any kind of wheels, right? Because it's not competing against, that, that's always the thing. It's not competing against other cars. It's competing against whatever Horses people and did donkeys before. and bicycles and yeah. Yeah, motorcycles. In Japan, it was motorcycles. Yeah. Um, yeah, really fascinating, fascinating look at Japanese culture to look at those cars. And then it's funny, you see them now in the United States and people are all excited about them and their novelties here and there. It's kind of like a necessity. But yeah, but I mean, I'm, I'm guessing if you drove around in a Suburban through through tokyo you'd you'd be just as much a curiosity as yes, driving an az1 that's here. true it's true they have a big conversion van culture yeah. in mm-hmm. japan they're really into like chevy expresses and chevy mm-hmm. astros and stuff like yeah. that just probably like, the same proportion of people there that are interested in k cars here um mm. it's those people those of us who love to do what the what the opposite of what everyone's doing be contrary mm-hmm. yes Con- i think we're called contrarians oh, wow 
Okay. Um, all right. I hopefully the next time we record, I will have done, done, did, driven uh, Suzuki Cappuccino. I'm um, interested to hear the verdict. Yeah, me too. <laughs> me too. Um, I, same engine. So, you, hey, other thing, uh, AZ1 started out with an iron block, three cylinder, double overhead cam, four valve per cylinder, timing belt motor, and then gained one cc in 1995. One cc. 95. They made it that late. Uh, yeah. Uh, they only started in 92 hmm. or four or something, 92. Uh, and then uh, at the end of the run, got an aluminum block, uh, timing chain driven. Still dual Two overhead cam, cam mm-hmm. four valve per cylinder. Yeah, with 21% more torques. But of course, mysteriously, the same Same amount of horsepower. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Man, my ass. Yeah, I should, I, I got a dyno one. We got At a dyno a all three race. of these cars. Yeah. I need to do an Icons episode on these cars because I think like an Icons on K cars, I can get that. Uh, Big Willow. No, God, no. <laughs> Is it lap time? No, it ran out of gas before it made it to the end of the track. Um, <laughs> but we have a teeny tiny fire truck. Uh, front of yes. ours, that you run the, you run the lap time with a sundial. I mean, I think you gotta get like do the do the uh, Sonoma Raceway right up the road here has uh, uh, they have a golf cart. Uh, oh, they, they have, have a, a karting a, track. A karting track. Yeah. Oh yes, that's mm-hmm. a great idea. Right? Wow. Get Randy fly Randy Pope's smaller cousin out. <laughs> 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 I haven't set a lap time in a, on a karting course. That's a great idea. I would oh, watch right. that. Okay. I keep thinking I'm gonna you know I need to invite the throttle house out. Get the ABC cars and just do one big stupid like discount sandler festival. versus throttle house festival of festival K-car of stupidity. displacement. <laughs> okay. Yeah, It'll be fun. Oh well, that's uh, that's episode that. sixty five. Was it? Yeah. Of the Car Margin Show. It says it right there. <laughs> yeah, uh, Samsung. Your TV lasted ten hours. I think mm. we decided it was more than that. More than ten hours, but less than um, um, an acceptable less amount than of time. Six months. Maybe one of these days I'll get rid of this wire too. Well, if we don't have a TV anymore, we probably we don't, don't need, need a wire. wire. Should I just have like the Carmudgeon show printed on a piece of uh, canvas and paste it on the wall and we're done? Hang it over the TV. Perfect. All right. Episode 65 is now concluded. Join us next week where we'll have more Carmudgeonly, curmudgeonly observations about cars, thus becoming the Carmudgeon show. All right. See ya.